Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the Word that is about to be shared. We pray that you'll impart into us what must be imparted and stir our hearts to something worth living for. In Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 5. If you're there, you say amen. I want to share something and then we go into a certain prayer. Let's read. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw an angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, to lose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of orders, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seal thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue, and people and nation and has made us and to our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts of the elders and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand a thousand of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive what number one power two riches three Four, strength, five, six, seven, blessing. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to share a few things in a few minutes and then probably take us to a certain kind of understanding. There is a prayer that is personal to God when a man needs something, okay? Depending on the need. Certain so people go to the presence of God with a place of anxiety, and the scripture tells you, Be anxious about nothing, but in all prayer and thanksgiving, make your requests known unto God. He says, If you do this, the peace that passes all understanding shall guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. Some people go to the presence of God because they are hungry for more. They say, God, I want more of you. I want more of your power. I want more of your glory. I want more of your peace. I want more of this and that. And then God answers. And then certain people go with a certain indifference. Like James says, some of you pray and receive not because you pray amiss, because you want to consume it over your lusts. You can't believe there are certain people up to now who pray selfishly. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, they don't have a vision of the future and mind of God pertaining what they want God for. They just want a car. You get it? To one man, it's just the tool of the gospel. To another one, it's just a car to feel good because they are Christian. You get the difference? To another one, it's just a house for shelter because it's also a tool in one way or another to represent who they are in the kingdom. To another, it's just a house for the family members who treated her so wrong when she was under their rooftop to prove to them, hey, even me, God came out for me. Direct translation. So you understand what I'm trying to say. So 
There is a place where everybody has their own understanding of why they pray and why they seek God. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the Bible says that all the ways of a man seem rightful. Okay? All the ways of a man seem rightful. But God judges the heart. Or rather, you see, when you're dealing with the heart of man, when you say, for example, can you teach us on Sunday how to pray? Everyone knows how to teach how to pray. At least there's some people who say, ah, me, I think I can share someone. Okay? We are going to teach about prayer. The guy says I was praying, and then the Lord revealed to me that the mystery of prayer is in the book called Acts. Acts, A is adoration. C is confession. T is thanksgiving. And S is supplication. So when you start to pray, firstly, adore God. You're wonderful. You're beautiful. Beyond description. You are the Alpha. You are the Omega. You are the present and the future. Then remember that as you adore Him, you have done some things during the day that require you confess some sins. Then after that, you thank God for your waka, your DVD prayer, your children, your family. And then after that, you make some more supplication. So now that you have learned how to pray, can you repeat after me? A is, C is, T is, and S. Now can we pray? Father, you see, that's why I told you that everybody, everybody, in one or another, when the Bible says that there is a way that seems rightful, that was the second point I wanted to give you. But the end thereof is destruction. There are certain people who seem like they know what they're doing, but they don't really know what they're doing. Some even don't know that they don't know what they're doing. Job, the Bible says that he esteemed the word of God better than his necessary food. But yet he was a man like in Job 3, spoken of as the things that he greatly feared always came upon him. He was troubled, he was never quiet, he was restless about it, but yet the Bible says these things befell him. He broke the hedge of his life, like Ecclesiastes 10 says. He broke the hedge of his life. When he broke the hedge of his life, the serpent beat him. But even when the serpent beat him and he was all afflicted, he could still say that I esteemed your word more than my necessary meal. That means Job is likened to a man who would read the Bible every day, read the word every day. He's fasting and praying every day, but he has no results. Or if he should have, any results, they are only for a time until the serpent shall come and bite because it doesn't matter how much depth of knowledge you have in the word and how much prayer you think you carry a job. If you don't know how to keep a hedge on your life, the serpent will bite you. You understand what I'm trying to say? So sometimes there are Christians who seem like what they do in the gospel is not equal to the results that they receive. The Christian must understand that the gospel is a result-oriented experience. Hallelujah. You must be the Christian that seeks results for everything that you proclaim. That's why Paul says, I'd rather not speak of the things self which Christ has wrought by me. I don't want to speak something the Spirit of God has not worked in me. And I don't want to stay comfortable if what I know cannot give me the results that I need. Praise the Lord. I must get the results for what I need. Hallelujah. Salvation is not a spiritual world only, but it's a world of spirits. When you entered salvation, when you became born again, you entered what they call the world of spirits. Some people call it the spiritual world. But when you say spiritual, it means spiritual is just a tendency but not the nature. But when you say it's the world of the spirits or it's the spirit world, that's the right full statement to say that this is the spirit world. It's not just the spiritual world. Spiritual means it's just by tendency, by action spiritual, but by nature different. But we are not talking of a spiritual world. We're not talking of a spiritual Christian. We're talking of a spirit Christian. And we're talking of a spirit world, a world which is of the spirit. The angelics, which are good spirits. You get my point? The demon spirits, which are not good spirits. They have their also rankings from what you call the powers, from what you call the rulers, the principalities in high places, and all these kinds of things. And everything reports to its own. Even the devil, in his disorganization, has a certain order. 
You get what I'm trying to tell you? So when Paul says a statement as sensitive as, now that you live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit also. It means it's one thing to say, I live in the Spirit world, but it's another when I also learn to walk in the Spirit world. There's a difference between living in the Spirit realm and then walking in the Spirit realm. You understand what I'm trying to say? But sometimes certain people read such scriptures and they think that they are as obvious as they read them. For example, if the Bible says if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I'm going to come there. The Spirit was ministering to me yesterday, or this morning I can say, very early in the morning, about 2 a.m. And he told me, do you know, many Christians exist, but they don't live. You get the difference? Do you know that many Christians exist? But they don't leave. They exist. They exist. But they don't leave. They have a physical experience of everything you'd conclude as this one is an existing person. But they don't really leave. When the Bible says that recall ye yourself dead unto sin, but alive unto God, the place that gives you life is when you are alive unto God. Not just alive, you are alive unto God. If you're speaking of alive as just alive, just a breathing person, you know, just a breathing thing, you know, like when the psalmist says that there is a spirit in man, the spirit the psalmist speaks about is not the spirit God speaks about in the new creature. Numa is just breath. We're not talking of Numa experiences. No. We're talking of Zoe experiences. We're not just talking about what it means to be alive because of the breath of God. We're talking about the place where the life which presents or creates the breath enters your spirit. The Bible says, Recall ye yourselves dead and to sin, but alive unto God. Alive unto God. You are alive unto God. You are alive. You're not dead. You're not just existing. Some Christians are just existing. They are not alive. They're not alive. I wish I can explain this. I'll give you an example. The biggest experience of a blind man is a man who only can see with his physical eyes. That's the biggest level of blindness. That's the biggest level of blindness. One time I was tuning my television years ago. And for some reason I bumped onto this Oprah show and I'm watching Oprah. And then they invited a famous musician, some of you know, he's called Stevie Wonder. You know, he's this blind guy who sings when his eyes are closed. Really? Okay, he doesn't have eyes. He puts on shades and then he starts to sing like this. You know, he plays his piano when he's like this. Stevie Wonder was taught by a certain cultic group of people in one of the highest levels of sorcery the world has known. And they taught him to smell colors. Live on television. They brought something, he just said, he says those are pink shoes. And they were pink. A blind man could smell color. A blind man could smell color. So when the Bible says that the children of this world have become wiser in their genes than the sons of the light, it means to say, how can a man thrive and prosper so effective? Give me the Amplified Bible that. And his master, listen, praise the dishonest and unjust manager for acting shrewdly and prudently for the sons of this age are shrewder and more prudent and wiser in relation to their own generation, to their own age and kind than are the sons of light. The sons of light are not as prudent. They are not as wiser. They are not as shrewder in the things of the spirit as it is the children, which are not of this generation, they are of a different kind, they are of a different nature, but they are shrewder. They are shrewder. How could a man smell color? How could he smell color? Yet he's a blind man. So when the Bible says that people die because they lack knowledge, there's a place of knowledge that goes past, I can see the word. There's a place in knowledge that has to give you the ability to see further. You see, knowledge is not just one dimensional. You read and then you understand with your mind. No, 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 no. That's why the knowledge that enters the ears, the scriptures define it as perception by the ears. That means there's a place where the human ears perceive. 
We were meeting with a certain guy a few weeks ago. He came, he's one of those guys who has been hitting us so bad on radio that we're false ministers of the gospel. You know, long story short, he started to meet a few people to, well, group up a story uh, to just destroy us. You know, some of those Christian badgers, I don't even know where they'd be from, but he cooked up his own story to destroy us. So when he went to collect much information, he landed on somebody who started to correct him on many things. And then he realized perhaps, maybe, just maybe, these guys are not what they say they are. Because they were told we don't fast yet, we've been fasting. They are told we don't type yet, we type. You know, very outrageous things, posters. So, well, they started doing their own business and then they started talking and everything. I don't even know, I don't even want to know the details. We met over coffee and started talking. And well, he said, I understand you guys, I'm sorry, I had a wrong story, I'm going to make it right. So he agreed. We are okay, cool, we'll meet another time, we'll go home. And when I'm on my bed, the Spirit of the Lord carries me in a vision and takes me to a meeting where this fellow is, and he's saying, we can only break them if we get in them. And I said, what? So really, this dude met us, to act like he's for us, such that he can get into us and then destroy us. And this is the spirit on him. Oh, okay. So I called my man of God. I told him, okay, this dude I think is up to this. So we know how to address him the next time he wants to meet us. In all humility. Not pride, but you know what? Humility. How could he think that he could do that and we don't know? How? Now, I cannot say, I don't even want to claim the place of prophet. But I want to claim a place and say, it's one thing for a man to see physical and not see in the soul and not see in the spirit. Those are the three kinds of eyes. You get it? The first dimension of seeing is your physical eye. And that's the least and weakest because it can grow dim. And it's limited to the physical world. Very few occurrences will cause your physical eye to see in the spirit realm. Majority of the occurrences in your life will usually move around the place of the spiritual eyes. But when we call spiritual eyes, there are two kinds of eyes in the spirit realm. There is a soulish realm. It is spiritual in its own sense because you cannot see it physical. But it also carries certain eyes. For example, if you imagine when you're driving a car, those are eyes. You see yourself drive that car. Those are eyes. But those are in the soulish realm. They are in the emotional of faculty. The gulf that causes a man to think and imagine. The spirit realm is not controlled by the kind of sight that the soulish realm has. Many people confuse the soulish and the spirit. They think the soulish and the spirit are equal. They are not equal. In fact, if you study the scriptures very clearly, you realize that when you're dealing with a man in the sight of the soulish realm, you realize that the primary place of ministration is either imagination or, if not, majorly dreams. That is what it says in Job. For while they are asleep, the Bible says, he openeth their ears to seal their instruction, to rob man of purpose and pride. While men are asleep, he openeth their ears and sealeth their instruction. He sealeth their instruction. He sealeth instruction. He gets one instruction, throws it inside the man's ear, but because the man is asleep and as he is sealed by instruction, it is translated into a certain form and the man starts to see it as a dream. You get my point? So for you, you think you're dreaming, but it's actually God's sealing instruction. That is why for you to know that God is speaking to you, you'll usually realize that there is a quickening of how God throws instruction in your soul. You understand? For you to get in the spirit realm, there's a very quick experience for the dream that comes versus the length to which you need to explain. That is why some people, you realize every time God is usually sealing instruction, many a time the dreams are very short by vision, but when you start to explain them, they are usually longer. Or when you start to explain them, they start to unravel more truths and things about the things that you've seen. But consequently, because it's an experience of sealing instruction, why does the scripture call it seal instruction? The experience when God is throwing vision and opening the ears of men in the soul, this is how he does it. He gets instruction. Are you looking at me? Who's birth and then seals. You get it? He puts and then what? Seals. He seals instruction. He doesn't want it to leave you. 
That is why you should have a problem if you forget your dreams. If you're the kind and either you don't dream or you forget your dreams, you have a problem. Because any person who is interested in witchcraft, if they want to bewitch and destroy a Christian, the first thing they do is to seal the gulf of hearing and dreaming on the Christian. The moment your dream life is frustrated, it's very easy to work with you on anything. Because they know the place that receives instruction should not be a life. It should not be a life. Otherwise, they'll send witchcraft and you'll dream it. And the moment you dream it, you'll wake up through your spirit and say in the name of Jesus, I break it. So they know that you are strong enough to break. What do they do? They realize they can minister to you in a place of either making you forget your dream, you understand? Or engaging you in things that don't even matter. Some people you realize, some days you dream very important dreams. And that day you wake up and you're a busy body. Somehow many thoughts come to your head. You find yourself doing a lot of this. And then during like about 3, 4, 5 p.m. And you're like, oh, oh my God. I had a sudden dream. I had a sudden dream. I had a sudden dream. Oh my God. I had a sudden dream. Why? He made you busy enough. But for some, there are people here. And you can ask them when was the last time you dreamed. And they never dream. They never dream. So dreams have their place in the gospel. The Bible says we're led by the Holy Ghost. It's true that dreams have their place. They do have their place, even in the new creature. Look at Paul. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. How did he receive the Macedonian call? He had a dream, and in the dream, he saw a man in Macedonia bidding them to come. In a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood at Macedonia, a man praying, saying, come in two Macedonia and help us. He was in the night. He was sleeping. And a vision came. He saw a man in a vision. Come. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? So they have their own place. But they're not the primary place for the Christian. The primary place for the Christian is the spirit. Okay? So yes, that's the essence now of the third level of seeing, which is the sight of the spirit. The essence of the spirit is to judge the matters of what is sealed by God to your soul. You get my point? The instance of the Spirit is to judge what is sealed in your soul through the visions and dreams you might have in the night or to even go past the place where you do not necessarily need to dream. When you're dealing with the Spirit realm, that lady visited my office, she can tell you. When I was praying with her, after I finished praying, in a vision I saw a little girl and I saw the name Rita. And I told her, who is Rita? And she says, Rita? And I said, yes, I see A friend of yours called Rita, and she's disappeared for some time. That girl needs you. Rush for her. And she says, oh, she used to be in the same hostel we were in. So she shifted and went to another hostel. But from then on, it's been long since I saw her in church. You get it? Now you can say, oh, that's a prophet. Yes, you can call me a prophet if you want. But I call it being alive unto God. That's what I call it. I don't call it being a prophet. No. Sometimes we forget that the place of prophecy, okay, it can function more effective and quicker when a man is working in the office. But a man should not be denied to access the spirit realm to see, even if he's not a prophet. Your life cannot just be something that is not predictable at all because you think you need a seven special man of God to go on a prayer mountain, why, and fast for five days X and then get a prophetic answer. No, no. You must be alive unto God. You must be alive unto God. Do I celebrate prophecy? I do. And probably you can even sound prophetic. Yes. But to me, most importantly, why does it work when I'm alive? Why does it work when I'm alive? Why does it work when my soul is alive unto God? So it goes beyond I dreamed. No, it, can, it has to go beyond I dreamed. It has to be in a place where even when you're seated there, you can sense something. It has to be in a place where even if you're not sleeping and you're seated there, you can sense that there's danger coming. You can see in the spirit and say, I think this is going to happen. I think this is going to happen. Why? Because you're seeing it. That is now the eyes of your spirit. That is the eyes of the spirit. Isaac is blind. The scriptures tell you. A hundred percent blind. And Joseph brings two children in front of him, Ephraim and Manasseh. The scriptures tell you he crosses his hands. 
And when he does cross his hands, Joseph tells his father, Father, not so have you done, for thou hast put the hand of the younger to the old and the older to the younger. And now Isaac tells his son, My son, I know. I am blind, but I know. I am blind, but I know. I am blind, but I know. I don't know you understand what I'm telling you. And the guy who knows is not a spiritual fellow. He's a living soul. Because the Bible says that the first Adam was a living soul and the second Adam was a life-giving spirit. Jose, Lepa, Tala. The guy saying I know is a living soul. Because he's patterned after the first Adamic nature, which is a living soul, not a life-giving spirit, which is the Lord from above. He was not a spirit. He was a son of Abraham with a covenant relationship, not a spirit relationship. He was with a covenant relationship, but one with a covenant relationship had the ability with closed eyes to see. That means it didn't matter whether he had eyes or he didn't have eyes. What was most important was that he perceived certain things by the Spirit and the divine instruction of God would help him understand where Ephraim is and where Manasseh is. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? I'm talking of a place where you get in God, where it doesn't even matter whether you saw something, you either way see it. We are moving into a dispensation and life where men tomorrow morning will come to say, man, I'm sorry about what happened. I saw what happened to you. Yet he wasn't with you, but he saw. And he's not a prophet, he just saw. He's too alive unto God. He's too alive unto God. That is why some of you realize, many times when you're in trouble or you're in some kind of issues, some of you, I look for you. You've noticed? Some of you, I look for you. Why do I look for you? Because I don't need to be there to know you're in trouble. No, 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 no. As in Nairobi, when we had one of our ladies hit her head on us, something in Panero, I saw a vision and she was in trouble. And I sent Pastor Zach, text message, I sent Pastor Zach, look for this lady, she's in trouble. And indeed they found out when she had passed out. I didn't need to first find out, huh, you're going to pass out? No, she did not call me, no. I didn't even know where she was. You get it? So you also had to use spiritual DNA to locate her. But the point is, we must get to a point where we are so alive. Your child doesn't get a car accident like that, no. Before your child gets an accident, you tell him, child, don't go that way, why? Because I see trouble there. You don't just go into car accidents like that, no. You don't just walk in ditches. You don't just enter relationships. You don't come on. You don't just get into funny jobs. You don't just fall into funny ditches. No, something happens. Why? Because you are alive. You are alive. You are alive. You are alive. I don't know how I can explain it. You are alive. He says if we live, if we are alive in the spirit, let us also walk by the spirit. But the primary entity of walking by the Spirit, secret is this. He says faith. If you are dead, that's okay. But if you are alive, he said walk also. But if you should walk, he says very clearly, we walk by faith and not by sight. Before you prophesy, you must have faith that God can't show you a wrong way. Oh, you must put it in your spirit to know, I cannot just see the wrong thing. Listen, that's how we walk. You don't just say, oh, no, 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 I'm going to walk, I'm going to just walk, let me just walk. Listen, the life of the spirit does not dwell on chances, and if it does, you can only dwell on chances for this long. You're sooner or later caught up with the truth that you can't act Christianity for so long. One day you just have to be alive or dead. You cannot just be there. So when the Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. Some of you have realized that sometimes I call up people and say, you, I see you're suffering from this. Why do I do that? My spirit must be too alive to know. I can't just say that you're this when you're not. You must first have the mind. God just can't speak. Oh, I can't be in a place where I suspect he might speak or must not speak. No, I must be sure. I must be sure. I must be sure. Because we minister in the spirit realm. That's our ministry. The primary place that vindicates us as ministers of the gospel is ministry in the spirit, not physical. These physical things will later manifest because we have learned the art of ministering by the Spirit. But you must learn to be alive. You must learn to be alive. Let me explain. If a man says, 
in the day of the Lord, I was carried by the Spirit. This is the prophet. If a prophet says, in the day of the Lord, I was carried out in the Spirit. Carried out. That means he gets to a point where this is not a spirit speaking. This is a man's soul carried. He was carried out in the spirit. He was carried. And then you read a scripture as simple as that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount on wings like eagles. They fly. So, when he says that they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Do you realize that that walk is a walk in the spirit? Do you realize that that run is a run in the spirit? So they walk and not to run and run and not to fly. So in the day of the Lord when the Bible says, I was carried. Hi, yeah, yeah. He waited and not to be carried. The problem with Christians is we don't know how to wait on the Lord. We just want to say, Lord, you're wonderful. You're beautiful. Come on, blah, 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 blah. You're wonderful. I love you. No, waiting on the Lord is not just waiting for him to work. No, waiting on the Lord is just satala, blah, blah. They that wait. They that wait. Learn to pray. Learn a crazy life of prayer. Don't just pray. Father, I thank you. 20 minutes and then you get out. No. Lock yourself up in the room and just start katala. Mopo, popo, robo. Zalalala, kala. Shindalala. As you speak these things, you're waiting upon the Lord. You hold your peace. You hold it into God. And then you just wait. And then you wait. And then you wait. The Bible says he will renew your dunamis. He will renew your power. He will renew your strength. He will renew your strength. He renews your strength. He renews your strength. He renews your strength. When you get in a meeting, you know whose boil is disappearing. You know whose leg is getting in order. You know whose back is healing. You know who is getting a job. You know who is getting married. You know. You don't get in a meeting to minister. You get in a meeting to give answers of a ministry you had a few hours ago. That's called ministry. So when you're in a pulpit, you're just giving answers. You're just giving answers. The Bible says they went up on the ninth hour to pray. They wake up in the third hour to pray. They wake up in the sixth hour to pray. And in the ninth hour, he finds a man on the temple called Beautiful. He has waited. He was waiting the third hour. He was waiting the sixth hour. He was waiting in the first hours of prayer. So when he finds the man, he tells him, silver and gold, have I not? He comes with an answer. He says, but that which I have, I give unto you. Get up in the name of Jesus and walk. He just didn't wake up and made him walk. No. There's a reason why it was in that hour. Let's go above. Verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together at the hour of prayer. The ninth hour. And how many hours did they have? They used to pray in the third hour. They used to pray in the sixth hour. They used to pray in the ninth hour. They used to pray in the twelfth hour. So in the third hour, they were waiting. In the sixth hour, they were waiting. But while they were going in the ninth hour, they had waited enough, you understand? They had waited enough on the Lord. So they come in that power. And then they tell a guy, silver and gold have I none. But that which I picked in waiting, he said, I give unto you. Get up in the name of Jesus and walk. There is no way he will not walk. This is the ninth hour. We were praying in the third and sixth. For you are coming excited. You don't even know the primary places of waiting upon the Lord. And then you don't give answers. And you ask yourself, why aren't I getting answers? You don't know how to wait on the Lord. Enter a life that lands to Oho. Oho. That's why you call him Aranda. Listen, for me, when I wake up in the morning, the first time is for God. It's not for anybody. It's for God. Now I'm tired of talking. You talk. Then he talks. Then he talks. Then he talks. Then he talks. Then he gets to a place where he can't talk. Then I say, okay, now let's just chill. Then we just sit there. I'm not talking. He's not talking. We're not talking, but we're talking. <laughs> then I get in the middle and say, there's a prophet here. Oh, you think? Why? Because when you stand before men, worshiper, don't stand before men to create questions. 
Stand before men because you have an answer. If you don't have it, stay back and sit down. You do not need to step on a pulpit if you don't have an answer. Sometimes gifts deceive. Listen, there is a place where the gift can't go. There is a place where the gift can't go. It doesn't matter how much gifted you are. There is a place where the gift can't go. You think there are not preachers in this world? They are. You think there are not prophets in this world? Yes. You think there are not teachers in this world? No. There are many. And that's why I told the difference between the anointing and glory. The anointing can open a blind eye. The glory of God can bring a thousand men to see the blind eye open. You can't orchestrate glory without learning to wait. But the gift can flow out anyway. Even if you don't wait. The gift can come. Because he's without repentance. He just started up. Ra, ba, 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 and it's already there. But waiting on the Lord is more than just ra, ba, 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 ba. No. You must practice a presence with God. You must have a personal practice. In fact, one time I slept in the same room with my brother. He asked me one question. When do you pray? He asked me one question. When do you pray? Because I can talk with you the whole day. Then we get in a meeting and you release the anointing. So he was asking me, when do you pray? Because he was used to a physical, normal, predictable life of prayer. That is after carnal senses, exposed to lives of men which are still novice, seeking a place of recognition as prayers, prayer warriors, people who pray. You want to shout so everybody knows you're praying, Baga, baga, baga! Listen, baga baga ba won't put the leg back. No. Baga baga ba won't put the leg back. Some people think by shouting you have results. No. Shout if you're alone. Sometimes I shout when I'm alone. But there's a place where I must learn to know. You see, let me tell you the true reward. True reward is when you learn to do things in secret. But produce results openly. Somebody might say, ah, you don't pray. So how do you produce them? How do you produce them? You must learn a secret kind of prayer. He says, and the Lord who sees you do it in secret. And when thou prayest, uh-huh, thou shalt not be like the hypocrites. Give me the message version of that. Uh-huh. And when you come before God, listen, when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for stardom. Do you think God sits in a box seat? Next verse. Here is what I want you to do. Find a what? Quiet place. A what? Secluded place. So you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honest as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God. And you will begin to sense. The biggest problem with many Christians, they've learned to pray outside. Makarababa! Oh, he's praying. The man of God is praying. No. Sometimes I bubble inside. But sometimes when I'm driving, the people in the car can't sense. They just see my lips. But what's inside? Makatala. It's an engine. But I'm... Because I don't need to get in the car and say, Makaya! 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 You really? If you hear me shouting, no, I've seen something. When my tongue starts to shout, no, I've seen something. Because I don't wail well before God. The moment you hear me say, Rababa! You know, I not Arabic. Don't ask what, but there's something I've seen. So that's my act of thanksgiving toward God. He has seen something. So even when you hear me shout, you now finish the real prayer. I'm just celebrating the finished. Learn to get to a point where you're not a role player. Where there is nothing about you. Nothing about you. Nothing. Because there's a spirit of deception I've seen on Christians. It can easily pray in the presence of other bodies. I use bodies, not spirits, bodies. It just knows how to pray in the presence of other bodies. It knows how to pray when somebody is just, Makaya, they are seated. Eh? So, that's why some of you, you carry yourselves in prayer. You hold each other's hands. Bar-ra-ra-ra. Not because you're praying a prayer of agreement, but because one of them is weaker and there's a stronger one trying to help them. Why? Because for you, they always have to carry you in prayer. No. Join hands only. 
if you are agreeing on something don't just mbo you carrying each other and she's feeling sleepy let us sleep that's why me i can't wake up a person when i'm praying Mm-mm. let them sleep there's a place you can't take certain men there's a place you have to go alone even in these things of fasting, we can both fast for a day, but there is a place where you say, ah, ah, let me push another five. Please don't drag everyone in your five. Because sometimes you might end up role playing. You understand what I'm trying to say? Sometimes you might end up role playing because you think everybody feels five. No, you push your five alone and make sure nobody knows you're pushing five. Hide it so much like it's a secret. Because the Lord who sees you, in secret. You know, he sees in secret. He will reward you openly. Look at that scripture. That means any open demonstration is with men who have learned to do certain things in secret. Let me tell you, visions just don't come. Revelations just don't come. No, they just don't come. You must learn a certain secret affair. Sometimes I can drive without saying anything, but I'm so with God, and we're talking too much and a man's understanding of prayer is he has to be on the mountain shouting, la, 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 la. No, me, I'm quiet. But I'm so with God. I am so with God. I am so with God. I am so charged. So charged. That's why some people in there in my car, some of them start crying. Because I'm charged. You understand? I've learned to set the surge easy, like, ba, ba, ba. You know, without, ha, ra, ra, ra. No, I can just keep there. And inside, there's a groaning beyond that range. It's inside. It is burning. You must be consistent in the life of the Spirit. You should never be fond of God today. Uh, I don't feel like I'm in the mood to pray. No. Any day you're in the mood. Any day you're in the mood for miracle. Any day you're in the mood for sign. Any day you're in the mood for wonder. But the challenge with Christians is they do not know how to walk by faith. That's why I said, I know when God speaks, I'm sure he has spoken. I don't know, I remember one time a story of a girl I told her the father has lung problems. I told her, call your father. The guy said, no, daddy doesn't. He has told me he doesn't. I told her, you see, I'm past the level of proving whether your father has a lung issue. Don't even disrespect me. I said he has it. Go home. She went home. And the father said, I just didn't want you to worry. I have it. He had to have it. The scriptures have said in the book of Revelation that he was looking at a seal of a book that was written inside and out. Are you hearing me? And the Bible says the people sought for anybody worthy to open the scroll. And there was none worthy to open the scroll. But when the scroll was opened, there were singings and songs of the elders. And there was incense burned on the altars. And the Bible says that incense, the order, was the prayer of saints. That means in that time, when the seventh seal is opened, According to the scriptures, when the seal of the Spirit is open, wherewith no man was worthy to open save Christ, on the earth, God got certain men, carried them in the Spirit, and showed them the scroll, and told them pray. And their kind of prayer was not, do this God, do that. No. Imagine a man is on the earth, and while he's on the earth, he starts to see in the Spirit. And when he sees in the Spirit, he starts to see a scroll, and it's closed. And the Spirit of the Lord tells him, your prayer will open a seal of the scroll. Every scroll is a move of the Holy Ghost. Every scroll is a revival movement. You get my point? Every scroll is a revival movement. So when saints throw up prayers, and these prayers are received in the heavenly places and add order, as the incense which moves the sun, which is worthy of all, to open a scroll. Because it has writings both within and without. You realize that certain revelations are distributed to certain men for reading because certain men had a certain kind of prayer. You realize that there's another life of praying God. It's just deeper than God give me a DVD player. I need my phone. I need chocolate, particularly white. I want this and I want ice cream. No, there's a praying God that just seems to open scroll. For either the one which prays to read 
or for the one which can move in the same place of the spirit to behold and find a scroll open. There is one which is worthy, but he can still not open because he needs a certain prayer of a saint on the earth. Those kinds of men can pray down rain in any generation and that rain will go down. Those kinds of men can pray down one prayer. Evan Roberts made one prayer and the whole of Wales started to weep. One prayer. One prayer. And the whole of Wales started to weep. Sometimes you don't need many prayers. Sometimes you need one prayer in the right place. Sometimes you don't need a million prayers about the same things. Sometimes you need to get to a place. He says, I have caught up and carried in the spirit. Because he waited enough for himself to be so light in body. Or for the ability of the soul to be so flexible enough to leave the body to be carried in the spirit. And there he started to see. Some people don't see because they don't know how to wait enough to be moved from walking to running to flying. When you are carried in the spirit, you will leave that chair and go to Malago right now and see what is happening right there and then you will know what to do because you're carried. That is why we minister to the sick in a certain way. That is why sometimes I was teaching you to minister. Like some of you when you say, you know, somebody didn't lay hands, I was just doing like this. But really, I was walking in the spirit, entering their bodies, seeing where the disease is and fixing it and then coming back. It's not hard, no. You just need to learn to wait on God. Raise your hands and just speak to God. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Venero. Venero, make nonsense.